Chapter 27 is focusing on the creation of an American empire between 1890 and 1909. Uh, here is a political cartoon depicting Uncle Sam deciding what he is going to carve up for his dinner. You notice Cuba, you notice Puerto Rico, you notice the Philippines, uh, etc. And we'll get to all of these in the uh, slides to come. Now, when looking at the creation of an empire or imperialism taking over a smaller country, uh, there are several reasons why the United States engaged in imperialism at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. First and foremost, we're looking for a new place uh, to expand. Remember, in 1890, the census has ruled that the frontier has closed. We need a new safety valve in order to release some of our extra population. Um, we're looking to prove our power as we take over other countries uh, to create new markets in which to sell our industrial products that are coming out of the factories back east. These are all major reasons why the United States is looking to expand. Also add into the mix uh, yellow journalism at the, t at the time, that sensationalized journalism that we referenced in chapter uh, 25 uh, by Pulitzer and Hearst, who we'll talk about in a second, is really pushing forward this idea of imperialism, especially when we, when we get to the Spanish-American War. Um, the idea that it is our Christian responsibility to civilize these, quote, uncivilized people, these heathens, um, is another major reason. Mission, Christian missionaries had begun to already look overseas in order to help these poor people out. It's absolutely a paternalistic view of history, or it's our fatherly duty as the more developed country to uh, help these people out, or as Rudyard Kipling uh, called it in his poem, the white man's burden. Also add to this that social Darwinism. Now, we've already talked about social Darwinism from the perspective of people within the United States, the rich versus the poor, but this issue also applies between countries. America is strong, your country is weak, therefore the strong survive. Uh, this is especially promoted by the jingos of the day. Uh, the idea of jingoism is extreme, almost aggressive nationality. Uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Law uh, were uh, what were considered jingos or extreme uh, nationalists wanting to prove how powerful the United States was. Um, adding into all of this, so once again, all these ingredients are coming up right at the exact moment to make the time right for imperialism. Alfred Thayer Mahan in 1890 wrote a very influential book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Um, basically, this book is promoting the link between uh, world domination, world power, and control of the seas. That at every stage historically there has been a country that controls the seas and is therefore a dominant world power. Think of Spain with the Spanish Armada or the English under Queen Elizabeth and moving forward. Um, and so this book um, really helped to promote the building up of a modern day steel navy. Uh, as a way to prove our power, especially under Teddy Roosevelt um, when he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and later on as President. Um, in 1889, uh, at the Pan-American Conference, which is a conference of all the American states, um, the Secretary of State at the time, James G. Blaine, promoted what became known as the Big Sister Policy, that it's our job as almost a big sister here on, in, Amer in the Americas to take Latin America under our wing, uh, to open up their markets to the United States, and to promote more economic cooperation, basically advocating for a reduction of tariffs. So while it is economically advantageous to both parties, it obviously has a paternalistic view of Latin America. Uh, here you see Uncle Sam um, being all tied up with uh, uh, this uh, imperialism. Now, a couple of the areas that we're going to look at, uh, first and foremost, is Hawaii. Obviously, Hawaii is currently part of the United States. Well, here's how it happened. Um, Hawaii had long been a jewel desired by many Americans as early as the 1800s. Uh, it's the perfect place for people traveling to Asia, um, either for business or for whalers out in the Pacific Ocean. Um, in the 1820s, missionaries began arriving in Hawaii. And so you see a slow and steady progression of the takeover of Hawaii, uh, the population um, being infiltrated by white Americans at this time. 
1887, the United States received naval base rights to Pearl Harbor, and it continues on and on and on. But the big push to acquire Hawaii comes because of an economic concern. As more and more Americans began moving to Hawaii uh, for to build up businesses, particularly in sugarcane or in pineapple, like Dole, for example, uh, they obviously wanted to then sell their products back to Americans here in the United States. They are Americans, they have an American company, and they want to sell it to other Americans. But the McKinley Tariff of 1890 was crazy, crazy high. And since technically these companies were uh, operating in a foreign country, they were um, uh, being tariffed by the United States. They had to pay this extremely high tariff. Now, Americans living in Hawaii are like, well, the way to fix this is let's take over Hawaii. Then we won't have to abide by this tariff. Um, so they began advocating for annexation uh, and almost saying that the Hawaiian people themselves wanted to be annexed by the United States. Um, before the annexation treaty, though, could be pushed through the, through the Senate, uh, Grover Cleveland, which remember, Grover Cleveland uh, was what was known as a Bourbon Democrat. Aside from being in favor of laissez-faire, he was also against imperialism. He really didn't think it was our job to go overseas and um, try to take over other countries. Uh, he ordered an investigation to determine whether or not the Hawaiian people actually wanted to be annexed because the Queen of Hawaii, or the last Queen of Hawaii, Lili Lukulani, was saying that her people did not want annexation. And so um, this showed the truth that most Hawaiians really did not want annexation, and it was really just the white Americans that were pushing this issue. And so it was decided at this time that Hawaii would remain a republic for five years, and then they would discuss annexation again in the future. But Grover Cleveland received a lot of flack for this simply because he was stopping America's next phase of, you know, manifest destiny. That's our God-given right to keep pushing further and further west, especially now that the frontier had closed. Uh, and here is Lili Lukulani. Now, we'll get back to Hawaii in a little bit. Uh, other issues start arising within our own backyard, namely Cuba. In 1895, uh, Cuba, which was still a colony of Spain from way back in the day, 1492, um, revolted against the Spanish control. They wanted their own country. Uh, they said that the colonial administration was corrupt. They had some economic concerns. They wanted to be in charge of themselves. And these revolutionaries were called insurrectos or insurgents. Uh, they adopted a policy of scorched earth, basically burning everything to the ground. Uh, anything is fair game to try to push Spain out. This is total war. Um, the United States uh, really took notice because of American business that was there. Um, basically, we were making about $100 million every single year off of trade um, with Cuba. There was a lot of American businesses stationed in Cuba, a lot of American property that we all of a sudden, and very rightly so, became worried about whether or not our citizens were safe, whether their property was safe, etc. So we began to try to urge um, Spain to kind of deal with this and uh, bring this to an end. In Spen instead, Spain chose to send in uh, General Whaler to put an end to this rebellion, or as the Cubans called him, the Butcher. He forced uh, the insurrectos into reconcentration camps where many of them obviously died from disease, starvation, etc. Um, and all of this was being written about in the American newspapers, especially the yellow journalism of the day. There was a lot of remorse and uh, sadness for those Cuban people that they were being treated so unfairly by the Spanish. Um, but still, Cleveland is still trying to stay out of it. He is against imperialism. He's against jingoism. So for the time being, he refused the army to mobilize and get into business there. But he's almost out of office. So like I said, yellow journalism of the day, specifically um, from the newspapers of William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, they're more focused on winning the circulation war. They're not necessarily focused on uh, real journalism, reporting the truth. So oftentimes the stories in their newspapers were stretched, fabricated, or just completely made up. Um, because they were focused on selling more papers and obviously making more money. Um, these sensationalized stories are really uh, aiming at the hearts of the American people, obviously siding with the Spanish. Um, 
So because of popular sentiment and because there are so many Americans living in Cuba and their businesses are down in Cuba, in February of 1898, or I'm sorry, in 1898, the USS Maine was sent to Havana's harbor to, quote, monitor the situation. Basically, we sent a warship to Havana in order to protect American citizens and to be there in case something should happen and uh, we needed to step in. Uh, but in Febu on February 15th of 1898, uh, inex inexplicably, the USS Maine exploded in Havana's harbor and 260 men were dead. Uh, immediately, the... Um, Yellow journalism of the day is saying that it was a Spanish mine under the water or a, torpe or a torpedo that exploded the USS Maine. Uh, two investigations were conducted. The Spanish ruled that it was an accidental explosion, uh, a boiler exploded, and the Americans said that it was probably a submarine or a mine. Uh, the reality is we're really not 100% sure historically, but there is a lot of forensic evidence that it was a boiler explosion or a malfunction within the USS Maine that actually caused it to explode. But it doesn't matter what the real story is. It was about perception of the day. And because people were already uh, riled up over what was going on down in Cuba, people automatically assumed that it was the Spanish that exploded the main. And so remember the main becomes a rallying cry and a call to go to war because people were already uh, uh, foaming at the mouth to go and show those Spanish who's boss. Here is uh, the explosion of the main as depicted in the yellow journalism of the day. Um, here is another uh, uh, story from the yellow journalism of the day that depicted the Spanish uh, strip-searching American women on board their ships. Obviously, this would have been horrifying to Victorian-era Americans at the time. Uh, the uh, front cover of the world that the main was explosion was caused by a bomb or torpedo. So, Spain is very intent on keeping the United States out of this. They want this to just be an issue between them and their colony, and rightly so. But Americans are still calling for war. The Spanish met the two demands that uh, we had given them, namely to end the reconcentration camps and to call for an armistice with the Cuban rebels. But the American jingoes, people like Teddy Roosevelt and him included, were calling William McKinley wobbly willy because he wasn't gung-ho about going to war. Now, William McKinley was reluctant to go towards war because he had uh, actually fought in the Civil War. He knew what war looked like. It wasn't this romanticized image that a lot of Americans have of what war is. But... In the end, he couldn't deny public opinion. There were so many people advocating for war. Yellow journalism is daily screaming for war with Spain. He can't continue on and expect to ever be reelected. And so in April of 1898, he asked Congress for a declaration of war, and they agreed with him. And thus begins the Spanish-American War. Now, at the same time that the United States declared war on Spain, we also passed the Teller Amendment. Now, this is not an amendment to the Constitution. It's really just a promise. We said that once this war is over, we promise Cuba their independence. Basically, we were saying that we had no design to become uh, a new colonizing power to Cuba. Now, there's going to be some other issues coming out of that, but that is the promise at the beginning of the war with the Teller Amendment. So this war is, it happens all of a sudden. Americans are crazy excited to go to war, but it's very premature. We're not exactly 100% mobilized to go to war. Um, it's been a really long time since we've actually fought a war against another country or an organized force like we did see during the Civil War and uh, uh, prior to that. Um, so we've got Civil War veterans uh, commanding the American troops uh, down in the traffic. Tropics. We're not used to fighting a war in such hot temperatures and in a jungle-type terrain, especially in the summer months of 1898. Um, 28,000 American soldiers and 2,100 officers. Compare that to 200,000 Spanish. This, at least from the surface, it seems like the, sta the, the deck is stacked against the United States. Um, and in terms of allies, the United States really only has uh, Great Britain on their side, uh, namely because Great Britain is going to benefit economically from an independent Cuba if they don't have to deal with Spain in the uh, 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 meantime. But what the United States does have is an awesome navy, a strong steel navy headed up by the Naval Secretary John Long and the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt. So, 
Teddy Roosevelt was so excited about going to war with Spain. Like I said, he is a jingo that even before a declaration of war was declared, almost immediately after the explosion of the Maine, he ordered Commodore George Dewey, who had been stationed in Hong Kong over by China on February 25th, to start uh, descending upon the Philippines. The Philippines was another colony owned by Spain at this time. Um, so he wanted to get there um, immediately so that an American naval force was stationed in the Philippines when war was declared. And this was pretty smart because they arrived in Manila Bay on May 1st of 1898. So on May 1st of 1898, uh, George Dewey arrives in Manila Bay with six warships. The Spanish were unprepared. They did not realize that an American force could get there so fast, namely because they didn't realize that he had been uh, sent there before a declaration of war had been called. Um, and so the American naval uh, Navy destroyed all 400, uh, all the, Amer the Spanish ship, 400 Spanish were dead, not a single American casualty. The Jingos are so excited over this. But in the meantime, Dewey has to wait in Manila Bay uh, for the American soldiers. So they have defeated the Spanish Navy out in Manila Bay, but they don't have the ground forces to go on land and start the uh, ground assault against the Spanish. Um, and there was a possible... Uh, problem that where all of the European countries began coming to the Philippines to get their citizens out of there. And there was a little bit of a fear that Germany was going to start a conflict to try to seize the Philippines. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen. Um, and the American soldiers did begin arriving in August of 1898 and began coordinating with the Filipino uh, insurgents, the own other revolutionaries over in the Philippines as led by Emilio Aguinaldo. They were excited to have American help to win them their independence. Too bad for Emilio Aguinaldo that the United States was going to control the Philippines after this war was over. And when all this is going on, Hawaii comes up again. You know, it was one thing to deny annexation before, but we're in the middle of a war now with Spain. We're fighting in not only uh, Cuba, soon to be fighting in Puerto Rico, but also the Philippines over in Asia. We needed a refueling station in the Pacific on the way to the Philippines. And so there was no more discussion about this anti-imperialism business. Uh, and so through a joint resolution of Congress, uh, the Philippines were officially annexed on July 7th of 1898 and later granted territorial status in 1900. Uh, here is Emilio Aguinaldo with his Filipino forces. 